For the headlines, India's outsourcing industry braces for President Trump's impact on its business. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hails New Day in Israeli-U.S. ties after meeting with President Trump. Senator McCain warns that suppressing free press is how dictators get started. Plus, American fashion designer Zach Posen takes collection off runway to create dialogue. You are watching Eagle News Washington, D.C., broadcasting from the United States Capitol, bringing you stories from around the nation. I am Lynn Pence. India's $150 billion IT industry, the cornerstone of a thriving economic partnership with the United States, is on the edge as it closely monitors how U.S. President Donald Trump's administration will manage policies around the outsourcing and movement of skilled workers. Myla Simbulan reports. India's software services industry is concerned about a bill introduced in the U.S. Congress seeking to double the salary paid to H-1B visa holders, which would dramatically increase the cost for the Indian companies employing them. Indian IT sector leaders will meet both U.S. lawmakers and officials from Trump's administration to lobby against any major changes to visa regulations. Shandakshan Karantala, President of Indian IT Industry Body Nascom said details of the visit were still being finalized, but chief executives from some of India's big IT companies would be part of a delegation visiting Washington in the week of February 20. Today's global wars are not about trade or of investment, it is for talent. And a country which uh, closes its doors to talent is, uh, in a sense, uh, losing out. India's Trade Minister, Nirmala Sitharaman, said the government was concerned and that any such moves by the U.S. would have an impact on India. India's IT firms led by Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, and Wipro have seen growth slow in 2016 as customers delayed spending ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Staff from those three companies accounted for around 86,000 new H-1B workers in 2005 to 2014. The U.S. currently issues close to that number of H-1B visas each year. While few expect a complete shutdown of skilled worker visas as Indian engineers are an established part of the fabric of Silicon Valley, and U.S. businesses depend on their cheaper IT and software solutions, any changes are likely to push up cost. IT players told Reuters Late last year, they plan to speed up local hiring, acquire U.S. firms with bigger local workforces, and make a renewed push on automation to counter the regulatory threat. Meanwhile, workers at the IT hub of Gorgoin, on the outskirts of the Indian capital, see the proposed moves as regressive. I think that's, an, uh, that's not a very good move because, you know, it's, a, it's an era of globalization. Everybody wants to work together. Everybody wants to, you know, live with each other. That's causing a lot of problems, not just in a professional industry, but also for uh, families. You know, a lot of people who have been staying there have to come back now. Given that U.S. market accounts for 60% of India's IT exports, Trump's America First utterances have reinforced worries of protectionist posturing and unnerve the Indian IT industry which, as it is, has been battling headwinds of a slowing growth. The head of the Union for Business Process, Outsourcing Employees, R. Karthik Shekhar, said Indian companies should not keep all their eggs in one basket and look for opportunities in other countries as well. I think it's time now we look at other non-English speaking market. That is where French is important or where including China. Our companies have gone there only to make sure the work comes to China, but the companies have not done started working in Chinese language. India and ha and U.S. have a joint target of 500 billion bilateral trade, and experts say it may not be easy for the U.S. to ignore India's concerns. For Eagle News, I am Myla Simbulan, and I am one with 25. 
Thank you, Myla. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he agreed with United States President Donald Trump to create a team to deal with Israeli settlement activity in the West Bank. Angela Mendez with more. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who returned to Jerusalem after his first White House meeting with U.S. President Donald Trump, told his ministers on Sunday that a new day has dawned on Israel-U.S. relations. At a joint news conference with Netanyahu in Washington, Trump dropped a U.S. commitment to a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the long-standing bedrock of Washington's Middle East policy, even as he urged Netanyahu to curb settlement construction. Briefing his ministers in Jerusalem, Netanyahu said he agreed with Trump to create teams to tackle different issues, including Israel's settlement construction in the West Bank. I must point out that at the end of the meeting with the President, he shook my hand and defined the relations between Israel and the United States as a new day. And I must tell you, there is a new day here, and it is a good day. According to Israel's Haaretz Daily, Netanyahu spoke amid new reports on a secret meeting he held last year with leaders of Egypt and Jordan in a failed attempt by Barack Obama's administration to convene a wider regional summit on Israeli-Palestinian peace. Citing unidentified senior officials in the Obama administration, Haaretz said Netanyahu, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, Jordan's King Abdullah and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry convened on February 21, 2016 in the Jordanian Red Sea Resort of Aqaba. The newspaper said the initiative to involve other Arab states in the pursuit of peace with the Palestinians ultimately fizzled after Netanyahu withdrew his initial support, pointing to opposition within his right-wing government. Far-right members of Netanyahu's coalition have been emboldened by Trump's suggestion that he was open to new ways to achieve peace that did not necessarily entail creation of a Palestinian state, a benchmark of U.S. policy for decades. For Eagle News, I am Angela Mendez, and I am one with 25. Thank you, Angela. Coming up, Senator McCain warns that suppressing free press is how dictators get started. Plus, American fashion designer Zach Posen takes collection off runway to create dialogue. Eagle News Washington, D.C. will be right back. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. U.S. Senator John McCain, defending the media against the latest attack by President Donald Trump, warned that suppressing the free press was how dictators get started. The Arizona Republican, a frequent critic of Trump, was responding to a tweet in which Trump accused the media of being the enemy of the American people. McCain said in an excerpt of an interview with NBC's Meet the Press that was released in advance of the full Sunday morning broadcast that the international order established after World War II was built in part on a free press. I hate the press. I hate you especially. <laughs> but the fact is, I, we need you. We need a free press. We must have it. It's vital. If you want to preserve, uh, I'm very serious now, if you want to preserve democracy as we know it, you have to have a free and many times adversarial press. And uh, without it, I'm afraid that we would lose so much of our individual liberties over time. That's how dictators get started. They get started by suppressing a free press. In other words, in consolidation of power, when you look at history, the first thing that dictators do is shut down the press. And I'm not saying that, that's, that, uh, that President Trump is trying to be a dictator. I'm just saying we need to learn the lessons of history. Trump's White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, who also appeared on the show, said a New York Times article which reported that members of Donald Trump's presidential campaign and other Trump associates had repeated contacts with senior Russian intelligence officials in the year before the election was baloney. He also denied reports of conflict between members of the Trump administration.
But the truth is, is that we don't have problems in the West Wing. I mean, you read about all these stories of I don't get along with Bannon and this one said, actually, we've really gelled as a team and we get along great and we're working well together. American fashion designer Zach Posen takes collection off runway to create dialogue. That's next. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will be right back. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. American fashion designer Zach Posen shows us his latest collection, gallery style, through a photo exhibit and video installation. Jennifer Polinton of EBC New York with the story. American fashion designer Zach Posen offered an unusual presentation for his fall 2017 collection by shying away from the traditional runway format that most designers use to showcase their collections on at New York Fashion Week. Instead, the designer opted for an exhibition-style presentation in the old Tribeca workspace he occupied for 13 years before he moved his business to Midtown Manhattan. Twenty portraits of models wearing his new collection were hung throughout the space, resembling an art exhibit. The photographs, shot by an old friend and former roommate, Vanina Sorrenti, were taken at his parents' Soho loft where Posen grew up. The designer said he opted for this unconventional format after paying attention to the political atmosphere in the United States. And I thought this felt appropriate for today and what's actually happening in the world uh, and giving people time to communicate. At a fashion show, nobody speaks to each other. And here I want people to look at clothing, have dialogue, have interest of looking you know, at an image and being able to, to look into it. For fall, the designer looked at 1940 suiting for inspiration, but stressed that the main focus of his designs is craftsmanship. And the inspiration is always um, very pure. It's never too deeply theme-based. Uh, you know, it's really about craft process, about construction, uh, and beauty. So, you know, here we each photograph kind of represents a whole different group of a much larger collection. Uh, about 110 styles. Here we have about 20 in the imagery here. Navy shades or red and emerald green were featured in the photographs, shown in voluminous gowns and cocktail dresses. Models in the photographs, such as Lindsay Wixon and Hilary Rhoda, wearing the designer's latest collection, came out to the exhibit to pose in front of their photographs. Leo Rivera, a fashion blogger, said he liked the format. It's a very different aesthetic, for sure. It's something different we haven't seen Zach Posen do before. It feels as though fashion is meeting a gallery tonight. Ty Hunter, famous for dressing singer Beyonce, felt the same way. I wasn't expecting this, but I, I love it. It's refreshing to see designers doing something unexpected. I, I love it. And the photographs are beyond beautiful. On the other hand, blogger Cicel Bizet said she preferred the runway format. I love going to the actual shows and seeing the models walk because you get to create the movement. Zach Posen celebrated his 15th year anniversary and launched a new shoe collection that will be available on his website later this week. Reporting from New York, I'm Jennifer Polenten and I am one with 25. Thank you, Jennifer. Speaking of fashion, join me and Christine as we take you to DC Fashion Week with daily updates from local, global, and next generation designers to watch out for the year. That is today's Eagle News Washington, DC. Join us again next time as we bring you news that matters to you. Visit our website at eaglenews.ph, follow us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash eaglenewsph. I am Lynn Pence and I am one with 25.